The log is like the medicine wheel. It's round like all the different energies of the universe. If you aim your ax right at the center, it splits easily. And if we miss off center, it gets stuck. The ax just won't come back out. We see everything as being in a circle, the circle of the earth. So in, in the medicine wheel, in the great circle of life, in the east we have the sunrise and all the powers that are like beginning powers. In the south, the uh, element of water and the element of healing. And in the west, the sunset powers, the night powers, the, the powers of darkness, the unconscious. In the north, it's the powers of wisdom, powers of the mind, powers of the air. And in life, we can place all the things in our life on a medicine wheel and then step back and look at it. And sometimes it's a lot better way of approaching life than then seeing it as a linear line from beginning to end, like a lot of our culture does. In the native world, we, we like to put things on a circle, on a, on a medicine wheel. Oh, powers of the east there. This pipe is for you. You can take the first smoke of it. And we appreciate your energy here in this ceremony. The powers in the south too. This pipe is for you also. Put your prayers into it. Oh, sacred like powers of the west. All you wonderful powers of dreams, night, all the wonderful gifts that you bring us. This pipe is for you too. And your north powers that are coming soon, starting to touch the tops of the mountains there. Oh, we, we welcome you this winter. We'd like a lots of moisture in the form of that beautiful snow. And we really appreciate this nice sunny day to open this lodge. The fall time ceremony. With this smoke, we send our prayers for a good healing lodge in there. The sweat lodge is the sacred mother earth. When we enter into the womb, the sacred void, when we sweat, this is very similar to where an artist goes. This is when the creative idea flashes through the void and into the mind. Sacred grandparents. The sweat lodge is like the caves of our ancient grandparents. They use them as doorways back into the womb of our Mother Earth. Some of our ancestors were tribal shamans who had responsibility of taking young people into the caves for initiation and ceremony. After a frightening journey through the complete darkness down into the body of our Mother Earth, the shaman would light a fire. Upon the cave walls and ceilings were painted the animal powers upon which the tribe depended for their survival. Our shaman grandparents created our oldest examples of art. These ancestors also carved our first representations of the goddess, the goddess Gaia, Mother Earth.
After experiencing the fear in their journey and the awe in viewing these incredible paintings, the young people were highly receptive to the lessons of their spiritual teachers. For the sake of White Buffalo Woman that brought us this wonderful ceremony and it helps us in our healing. ego comes, it's an honoring the ego is giving to us. And we acknowledge that by giving tobacco or with a hope. It's not something we take lightly, it's a tremendous gift. When you honor that coming together with the animal kingdom, then the sculpture or piece of jewelry has a different charge to it. The ego beak, I'm going to make that right there, I'm going to cut that shape out. It doesn't look quite the same because I'm going to forge this and bend it and it'll eat up some of this space out here when I curve it. I have to use a little different pressure on my saw. They have the best sight of any animal. They can see a rabbit from almost a mile up. Kind of things about them that are sort of human-like. Uh, like the eagles here, they know me. I, I walk out and they'll call to me sometimes and I'll call back. And bumping out a three-dimensional shape for the beak. So that is the general shape. They literally seek out my attention when I walk out. If I, if I don't notice them up in the tree, they'll call to me. See, that's starting to look more like an eagle beak now that I've got some dimension to it. I say it, the solder wants to go to heat, so this is getting the bezel is getting hot much faster. So I'm really concentrating about keeping the heat under here. So I'm going to get that solder going first, and then that solder will flow into the edge there, and that's going to make it want to chase all the way around. And how it's starting to go along the bezel there, you can see it's starting to makes a little silver line. For me, there's a magical world. And there is for everyone, but you have to accept it. And if you don't accept it, it doesn't exist for you. But if you open yourself up to it, you'll start seeing that nature has a voice. Each animal spirit has a different medicine that they bring to the world. The, the early artists were, were shamans. They, they were connecting with spirit and they were connecting with the animal powers and nature. And, the first art we have are cave paintings. The archetypes are our own personal energies. And they had an understanding of that. You have to break through and just realize that they're, they're symbols that help you connect with the powers, and the powers are all in the self. And everything that happens can be an oracle that you can read. An eagle coming is a big medicine to me, you know, and I see them often here. When I do an animal in my artwork, I try to be in that same um, place of, of uh, appreciation and acknowledgement so that the animal 
is welcomed in, his spirit, his, his, his animal power, his, his essence is, is brought into the work. It's just not a copy or a photograph or a photograph in jewelry. It is something that I've related to and energetically uh, asked to come and be in my work. Well, I grew up in this sort of idyllic place in California, in a little village, Ojai. It couldn't have been a nicer environment to grow up in. After my dad got back from the war, he was a drill sergeant. He came back a changed man and became a Baptist minister. My mother was a hairstylist, had her own business, and was a super mom. We moved to East LA, which was probably the worst place in, in California at the time living in track houses in all directions. The place where they put all the factories, you know, all the gang warfare around me, and all of a sudden I, I was in a, a real hostile, very urban environment. It so always uh, was my favorite thing to do is to draw or to build something. My mother always wanted me to be a doctor. I went into college as a pre-med major, but the academics were way over my head. It didn't last long, you know, just a semester or two, and then I was an artist. That's the only thing I was really good at. Early on in college, I uh, was already starting to sell my work in galleries. I was doing modern art because that's what I was taught in college. Eventually that led me to getting into uh, a one-man show in a museum in Santa Barbara. At, at a certain point, I, I realized that I could see my life laid out ahead of me. I just knew that it didn't feel right, not being authentic. I, I, after that, I decided to quit art. Uh, some friends were moving out to a wilderness area to start a commune and I thought that's for me and I just walked away from my art and decided to be a farmer. Sacred Mother Earth, Sacred Sky Father, oh sacred grandparents from the four directions, come to us and be with us here in this ceremony now. I just like to start the day with a prayer. It's It, it just sets your whole day in, in a nice nice way. So that prayer isn't always about myself. I think that's real important that, that when, we, when we do ceremony, we always want to reach out and send that ceremony to, to some place in the world that needs the help. And I think that it's so important in this day and age that we have a sacred space because the sacred is so neglected in our culture. And I like to honor the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine and that's why I have uh, these archetypes on either side of the temple in here. Isis was one of the first uh, concepts for me of, of the earth mother goddess. White buffalo woman became more and more important to me as an archetype of the sacred feminine. So she's white buffalo Isis. Sernunos Buddha. Sernunos is a northern Europe forest god, and the Buddha is very important to me too as a male archetype. Uh, the meditative one, the one that's uh, seeking for enlightenment, but actually the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine are parts of ourself. Every man, every woman has both, and part of our walk on earth is to find the sacred balance where, where those two are in balance with each other and neither one of them is dominant. I wanted to involve sacred geometry in the building and the pyramid has that built right into the energetics of it. And also I've been to Egypt a couple of times and been in the Greek pyramid to do ceremony and it definitely, uh, to me, there, there's definitely something about the energy in the pyramids. And then from there I sort of just improvised and I originally just planned to have a little temple with south-facing glass because I'm going to have a lot of foliage inside and I wanted a passive solar greenhouse plus a place to do ceremony in the center. And all the different dimensions inside the circle of what we do ceremony in the center is uh, directly related to the square of the pyramid as far as the dimensions of the sacred geometry. That makes it 33 feet high in the center which of course is there again the sacred geometry measurement because of the the angle of the pyramid. In the winter time the sun is about an angle like this 
and the angle of the sun hits clear to the back wall, which is all masonry, stonework. And that masonry soaks up the heat and gives it off at night to keep the place warm, even in the middle of winter. Um, it's pretty comfortable inside. And I was thinking about putting some type of structure inside to sleep in, but it would break the energy of the pyramid. So then my next thought was about a little A-frame on the side. That's when I started designing this, which is a little area to live in. That's two stories, a spiral staircase. I hadn't planned originally to live there, but that's the way it turned out to be. So I get to live right next to the temple, and um, it makes it very convenient for me to walk in the morning, walk in there and do the morning ceremonies. And then it gives a little place for when we have a group of people here, we have a place to have a nice feast afterwards. I spend a lot of my life in the natural world. There have been wonderful elders and teachers in my past. Although nature is my primary teacher. She holds the secrets of living within the sacred balance. And I strive to create that medicine in my artwork. <laughs> I begin my work with a blessing. I'll smudge with sweet grass to bless the tools, the elements that I'm working with, my own body. So, for this particular part of it, I want more structure to it. If you crimp the blade, as you turn it, it'll break. So, so I'm going to drill a few little holes in here. And then I take my blade undone, stick it through the hole, then I can do all these inside cuts. so good to be making jewelry. <laughs> been doing everything but for a while. Pretty much stays in one place, just up and down, where the metal is what I'm moving. So I actually am correcting my drawing a lot of times, as I saw. Artists have a sacred duty when they work with the archetypes or magical symbols. The archetypal symbols are our personal mythology, which helps us to touch and understand the conflicts and harmonies of the different parts of ourselves. The personal myths that appear in our artwork also speak to the archetypes in all humankind. These powerful symbols can be used to manipulate and control people, or to heal them by helping to restore the balance with all the powers within the South. Solder the gold headband and the gold eagle feather down here. And we're gonna set a bezel stone right here. So the archetype I'm working with here is white buffalo woman. And that's a teacher that brought us the sacred pipe. And a lot of our teachings that we use, the sun dance, sweat lodges, most minutes have a real person somewhere along the line that the story comes from, but um, 
then a lot of mythological information starts flowing through that story. miss this point that to create something is such a wonderful, beautiful feeling and uh, carry through uh, inspiration to completion. The greatest challenge for me is being a business person. It doesn't come naturally. I'm not great at it. I don't type. I do one finger typing on the computer. I don't really even enjoy computers that much. In fact, I spend more time in my office than I do creating art. Yeah, there's so many things to look after. You know, I have bookkeeping because there's taxes. I have uh, emails coming in every day that I have to attend to. I have to take photographs of everything and then Photoshop them into something that can be used to show jewelry in magazines or in my inventory sheets. I have uh, several galleries that sell my work and each gallery has several pieces so I have to keep the inventory correct and up to date all the time. I have to order supplies, I have to keep my tools in good working order, I have to plan for the next show, send out invitations, I have to keep correspondence going with the people who collect my work. Then I have, I've been writing these books too, you know, and I'm an author and so that has another whole piece of my life. The creative process is wonderful, but without all of those things that I juggle in the air, then I would just be a dreamer. I might be able to create something, but it would never get out to the people and never touch anybody. My elders have taught me, I am the bow and I am the arrow. I am its flight. I am also the hunter and I am the deer. I was a vegetarian for a decade. I had become sensitive to the feeling of death and my meat that I ate. So I stopped eating animals. Eventually, I became sensitive to the world of plants. We need to eat in order to live, and I realized that we are all part of the wheel of life and death. When we die, our body returns to the earth and feeds both plants and animals. What was missing for me was the reverence and the honoring for the beings that die so that we can live. Animals and plants understand how we all give away to the circle of life and death. They give their life open-heartedly if we take time to celebrate their gift with reverence, appreciation, and ceremony. giveaway today. It's a beautiful heart, beautiful day. Ooh, this tobacco's for you. This tobacco's honoring your giveaway, your gift of life. Archetypes like Diana are very needed in our culture. I'm attracted to because she's a huntress, you know, the bow and arrow, and uh, she's very dynamic. So that's one of the goddesses that I, I like to portray in my art. She's also seen as the mother of all, all animals, and she, but she also has the power of the destroyer because that's what happens, you know, we all die. And there was ceremonies to that effect, a feast of a, a stag, a keen stag, they would call it, the, the main stag of the deer. So I, I, I like to portray her, try to bring back some of the balance of the old time. Equinoctes and solstices are 
are the holy days of the earth, honored all over the world, wherever you go in the world. Uh, people saw those days as, as very sacred. And the autumn is the time of harvest, the time of, of abundance. So all you growing plants, the plants that we eat, we have feasts tonight, plants that bring us so much joy, and the trees out there that give us our oxygen. All you people that are from the plant world, we, we ask you to join us in this ceremony. I so celebrate that we're going to have a new hunter in our circle this year. That's so great. I've seen all these young ones get older and start hunting and bringing in deer and elk different meats for us for the winter. And it's uh, Carissa last year was your hunt. Yeah. Got deer. deer, wasn't it? Oh, wow. sit here in this circle in celebration of all the people. Let's go feast. So this feather I've made out of 18 karat gold. And it's gonna go here on a buffalo woman's headdress here. And I have soldered a piece of electrum right here, which is a metal that I alloy myself. It's half gold and half silver. So all those ancient people saw the metals as something very sacred. And, and uh, I follow those traditions. To me, the metals are very sacred. They, they all have an energy and a power. And something happens, it's magic. And the ancient peoples were all aware of that. And they, they made jewelry not only to decorate their bodies, but to bring the energy, the sun, the moon, the different powers of the stones. You can kind of put those archetypes in the books now, and it's all a written word. When you finish with this, you'll really be able to see the different colors of the headband, which is 24 karat, and the feather, which is 18 karat, and the electrum which is half gold, half silver. You know, when people ask me where my ideas come from, uh, sometimes you just have to stretch yourself way out into another dimension, into something not maybe so comfortable, and, uh, and you get help. 
I like the ancient Greeks way of uh, viewing inspiration. They had a goddess named the Muse. And the native people would call him a, uh, a spirit helper. Some of my ideas definitely come from helpers. So there's a crescent moon above her head, which is a, a goddess symbol that's recognized all over the world. It also could be seen as uh, buffalo horns. I honor those helpers. I really, I leave little offerings. I, I pray to the ones that are helping me. I, I really uh, let them know that I appreciate their help. The stone that we use to make our sacred pipe set of, so it really, there again, the energetics of the stone here, going into the white buffalo woman's teeth. They are they, they enable me to do things that are way beyond what uh, what my life experience would be able to do. Once you get the inspiration, then um, you have to put your heart into it to to manifest it. I'm going to bezel this on, and it's going to squeeze everything together, so it's it's also held together with the bezel. But it, it is possible to have um, someone help to guide you through it, whether you're writing a book or making a sculpture or creating some music. Every artist that I know are a healer. Anybody that, that uh, is doing something, that they're bringing in some energy to make the world a better place, then, then the, there's always spirit helpers there that are, are available to you. Good hit. An experience that I experienced in the Sundance, temperature got up to 114, so I was literally not able to move. I was just so sick and so, I, I could not get up to dance. I was, I was just knocked down by the heat. Uh, there's this eagle that's up in the tree and I looked up and saw the eagle and I got this wave of energy coming in from the eagle and it came into my body and I jumped up and started dancing and I danced my strongest dance the whole time. It was such an amazing experience because it was there again you get so close to the spirit world in this beautiful design ceremony Things that might seem very ordinary in your normal world seem very extraordinary. And this was one of those experiences where I just felt like I had this huge rush of, of power and energy and I was able to dance the strongest dance of the whole time. It triggered an experience um, when I started drawing of what I felt of the eagle and me together dancing. and. As I drew it, then I, I realized that it was Sky Father, which is a symbol seen all over the world, you know, part bird, part human. As I work, I always try to create balance. That's, that's one thing I think artists, is, uh, is part of their shamanistic duty, is to try to bring balance to the world. So since I drew Sky Father, I also drew Earth Mother. I thought I'm going to have to do two sculptures. I can't do one. So then that beautiful sculpture kind of came into being, all from that one experience in the Sundance. And I chose White Buffalo Woman to be the Earth Mother sculpture. When my daughter was in her first year, I had a shamanistic experience that changed my life forever. I was helping a friend round lips a herd of wild horses when my horse started bucking. It reared up on its hind legs and then it fell backwards and it fell right on my chest. I found myself in a black abyss and I knew I was dead. I thought of my young wife and my baby alone in the cabin without electricity, miles from a neighbor, being left alone with winter coming on. I screamed in anguish and it echoed all around me and I knew I was in a cave. By screaming I could feel the shape of the cave and I started clawing my way along the cave until I saw a speck of light. Moving faster and faster uh, the speck became a cave opening. I flew out of the cave and saw my still lifeless body laying on the ground 
and falling into my body, I awoke. I couldn't breathe, and so I had to struggle to get some air into my lungs, which were collapsed. And then I realized I could hardly move, and my back was broken. I wasn't sure I wanted to live because the pain was so radically uh, excruciating. I have a friend that's even written a book about the wounded, the wounded healer. She, she did research to a lot of different shaman and they'd almost all gone through a similar experience where they had a sickness or a, an animal attack them or, or somehow they, they had sort of a, a death and rebirth and in that time they contacted the spirit world very closely and I feel like that was part of what happened to me. I, I, I literally, uh, when I came back, there was this, this connection with uh, the world of spirit that was much deeper for me. Setting in excruciating pain, I began making jewelry again. And it had a whole different look and energy. It had the look and feeling of the ancient Egyptian jewelry. I became more interested in doing healing ceremonies. So, I mean, I still was the artist was my main focus in life, but I also became a shaman at that time. Our darkest night of the soul, a lot of times, is our gift, as far as our creativity, as far as our personal power, as far as um, having a depth. into winter. It gets, the days are shorter and shorter and shorter and then all of a sudden, you know, at the, at the solstice and they start getting larger and on the horizon it starts going the other way. So all cultures notice that and they, they would always mark that point because that, that told them when, when uh, it was midwinter and everything's going to get better, long, you know, days are going to get longer, the snow's going to disappear up here. It's a, just a very big medicine time, the shortest day and longest night. The two darkest nights of my soul that I can remember. One of them was physical, one of my back was broken by the horse and I, I actually went into the, the world of death for a while and came back out. The other time would be when my family spit up. I, um, and that was an emotional death. And, uh, you know, my, my family, you know, moved two or three states away where I was separated from my children and, um, and, and then metaf not only metaphorically, it was, it was winter. And I was living in a half-built building without even a front door in the middle of winter up here. So I, I was also suffering from, from just the conditions that I was living in. And, but also just for that separation, I, I really almost lost my will of life during that time. Uh, you know, you, you think, why did the universe do this to me? You know, I just, it was uh, such a horrible, horrible experience. I look back on it and, and it sort of, I saw that in, in a sense I probably created the whole thing. I, as a young man, wanted to be a great artist. But when I, when I left and moved out into the wilderness that just, it, literally I, I was homesteading, I had given up art. And there was a part of me that still was, was not manifesting my dream as a young man. I ended up moving back to uh, the Los Angeles area and I lived in Malibu. And within a short time, um, a celebrity started buying my work because things that had happened to me in, in this shamanistic experience reflected in my work and, and people could see the, and feel the power in it. I have given over my entire life to it and sometimes that wasn't really great for relationships. It um, wasn't even great for my health because the muses that I'm working with, they're in the spirit world and they have no knowing of human physical limitations and a lot of times artists will die young. They get impassioned, they get 
so involved that they don't eat or sleep or they just work. When that horse accident happened, the largest challenge I had in my life was having a broken back. A catastrophic uh, um, occurrence. I, two of my vertebrates are crushed and their shape is more like a trapezoid than a than their normal shape. And I was in constant pain for at least a year and, and after that uh, I've never been without some pain. But what I was able to do through uh, daily practice of yoga, and as I did yoga more and more, I built strength around that area of my back and flexibility. In fact, I have way more flexibility now than I had when I was in high school. When you have these wonderful ideas, these just inspirations of something, and it might be a huge sculpture or even a huge building here. It's nice to have the dreams, but to manifest the dreams takes a huge amount of energy and work. And there again, it's, it's more of a, a warrior thing. You know, you'll be sometimes so exhausted that you can't hardly get up in the morning, and yet you'll know that certain things need to be done to complete a big bronze or a temple here. That was my warrior, it was get me out of bed, get me up on that ladder, that scaffolding, and, and uh, doing the carving and carpentry and uh, physical. And, and that's a warrior poise. It isn't, it isn't a poet, it's not this dreamer. It's, it's like you have to do something strong and, and uh, carry through. You have to carry through it. It's, it's sometimes you just have to go to the point of exhaustion, but in the end, um, you know, the elation of having finished an uh, art piece is just one of the greatest joys in life. I left a lot of tabs on this. I, there's just a lot of areas that I can put solder that I'm going to cut off later. So actually, when I design a piece, I'm designing it many steps ahead. Well, I've been attracted to the goddess energy uh, from, from many different cultures. I came across the story of White Buffalo Woman. It really struck a chord in me because I had some genetic memory there of my Indian ancestry. And it's also the archetypal goddess of the land that I was born into. You know, I, I live here. I, I, this, this white buffalo woman was the keeper of the goddess energy. She had these magical powers, could turn herself into a white buffalo, and uh, had all these wonderful sacred teachings. She is, she is the goddess of uh, the Native American. I had a, a dream. And I looked up and saw a, a big thundercloud. Oh, thundercloud, you know, I'm gonna fly up in that thundercloud. So I flew up in the thundercloud. And once I got inside of it, my conscious mind says, dream of lightning. <laughs> and lightning shot out of my body in all four directions. It was just such a big medicine dream, I could not ignore it. And so I just took Aoka as my name. And it's uh, been that way ever since. And that was probably 30 years ago. White Buffalo Woman, she became very primary in my life. And um, in the sweat lodge, she's the one that I call into there for help, you know, for healing. And when I'm sun dancing, I'll, I'll thank, thank her for her help in the sun dance. So she's, she's become a very close and intimate uh, helper to me. After all this juggling is done and I have all these wonderful art pieces that I'm doing and all this office work, there's a part of me that if, if I don't attend to them, 
then none of that is going to work well. I, I'm not going to be a good artist. I'm not going to be a good business person. And that's, for me, I need to take in all this energy from nature. I'll be working away and I'll look outside and if it's a beautiful day and it calls to me, then I walk away from my work and I don't care what deadlines are there or what. I, I want to be a real human. I want to be able to enjoy the things I love most. Existence, existence, innocence, existence, innocence, let me trust you. A friend taught me a ceremonial samurai sword dance, and I've used it in ceremony to kind of tap into my warrior. And once I get the idea from the muse and this wonderful interior creation starts coming out, I have to use the more active, aggressive warrior in me to manifest it, with the, to create all the work that takes to manifest this, this beautiful image. And so this dance helps me to get in that place of, a, of the warrior, the warrior not the, that kills and, and maims, but the, the warrior that, that can carry through the idea. There are many prophecies among the Native American people concerning the times in which we are now living. America's indigenous people were not surprised when the white, black, and yellow peoples arrived on their shores. The prophets among the red people foresaw the arrival of the new people that would overwhelm their ancient culture, the culture of Turtle Island, which is what Native Americans call North America. They knew the Indian spirit would all but disappear, but they also knew that Indian spirit would be reborn into all the new colors of people now gathered. These new people of many colors will see that we are all one people. They will be called the warrioresses and warriors of the rainbow. These people of the rainbow will not make war on other people and beings, but they will make war against the parts of themselves that are out of balance. Once that battle is won, they will rediscover balance with the environment and with all life. This religion is very old, thousands of years old, and it was on both sides of the world. You know, the sun is definitely the giver of life. I knew that I needed to be a sun dancer, and I was gearing up to see if I could get into the dance next year, and ended up meeting a crow sun dance chief. We fast food and water for either three days or four days. We have a 
tree in the center that you're dancing to, the sacred tree. The tree of life you find everywhere in the world. It's drawing the energy of the earth through the roots, drawing in the energy from the sky through the leaves. In the morning is the most beautiful time of the sun dance. We're all sitting there and they're drumming as the sun starts to get brighter and brighter. And then when it breaks over the horizon, we all get up and worship the sun as the giver of life. And we're blowing our little bone whistles and dancing to the sun. Then we rush to the tree real fast and then we dance backwards very slowly keeping our eyes on the tree. And in the tree there's a, a stuffed buffalo head and a stuffed eagle. Those are sacred helpers up there that we're dancing to too. We can dance to the buffalo or the eagle or the tree. As we dance in and out, I mean the design has been around for thousands of years. The fasting food and water is very painful, especially I've seen it 115 over on the east side of the state. And it's, uh, you just feel like sometimes you can't even uh, get up off the ground. You're so pushed down by the heat and, uh, and uh, fasting water. Through sacrifice, you, you achieve bliss. That's, that's the dance of Mother Earth. The sun dance has all this symbology in there. It's like a breath that goes in and out with all the dancers going in and out for all day long and sometimes way into the night. And the tree is very slow in its life. It breathes once a day. If we dance in front of that tree for one day or if we sit in front of a tree for one day, it can see us for one breath. Then the tree can have relationship with us. Ancestors that designed this ceremony did it a very beautiful way because without drinking water, you, you start to die. As you start to die, you get closer to the spirit world. You're getting very close to that door to connect with, with, the, with the plant world and, and, and the spirit world, really. Even the people outside in the camp, they're all part of the ceremony. And they all get something, and they all want to give something to the ceremony. It's healing for the whole community of dancers, and that energy goes around the world. To me, there's no doubt that that ceremony affects the entire world.
Yeah, my mother, she always had a garden when I was a kid. So I grew up gardening and I just always have loved it since then. I, even when I was in college, some friends and I rented a house together and we had a yard and I went, my gosh, there's a yard out there and I planted a garden. And she was part Cherokee and practiced some of the real old ways and she always had us plant the crops that grow above the ground when the moon was on the increase. So the moon's just coming into full right now, so I'm planting corn today. This is corn that was grown here in this spot last year. I saved some ears back for seed corn. We also took these ears of corn into our fall ceremony of blessing the crops from last year. So these are sort of my children, the ones that I planted and grew last year. And I'm gonna be having some of their grandchildren and I'll just keep this going. Gardening isn't about economics for me, it's, this is about ceremony. Ah, there's a worm. That's really helpful in the garden. It's about ceremony for me. I, uh, I like to have a relationship with the things I eat. And it's just good, it gets me off the bench and down here with my hands in the earth. It's good for my soul. <laughs> Corn will feed my body, but gardening feeds my soul. I looked down on the hill, and it looked like a medieval camp set up there. There was music going, and people all in costumes and artists setting up booths. I just felt like I'd finally found a home. The Ren Fair, that was, uh, I had a few galleries selling my work, but it was, it was mainly, that was my main income. College, I was doing sort of contemporary looking jewelry. That's what my teacher was teaching me. And when I started first doing the Renaissance Fair, I was doing just real simple things like brass belt buckles, peace signs. I could sell kind of inexpensively because um, that's the crowd that was coming at first. So the the kind of major archetypal jewelry that that really started taking off and becoming my major income uh, really was pieces that I was doing for myself. Pieces that wear more as regalia, things that I wear in ceremony, things that were helpful for me in a protective way. And all of a sudden what was happening is I would wear these things to the fair and then someone would want to buy them off my neck and all of a sudden I realized that there was finally becoming an interest in the more archetypal jewelry. And I started actually doing some, some alchemical type ceremonies that I read about. The shamanistic ceremonies that, that I was doing, you know, in the Native American tradition, the sweat lodge and eventually the sun dance. They, they put an amazing uh, charge on some of the things that I had learned, you know, academically through a book. And all of a sudden, not only myself, I, I mean, definitely I, I knew they were working for me to, to have uh, a protective necklace around my neck. But they started affecting other people. And, and so it was actually at the Renaissance Fair that uh, I started getting people saying, you know what you're doing, you know? They'd put on a piece and feel this energy, and, and I said, yeah, do you, do you know it too? So I started even having a community of people who understood what I was doing. 
which was real meaningful to me because for a long time I thought, well, this is just something I'm doing for myself and my family. And, and it's, it's just kind of way beyond what, uh, you know, I can talk about. And all of a sudden there was a community of people who I could talk to about the energetics I was putting in my work. That's a part of it too. I, I figure that some sometimes a young person will come by and see you know, you know what's possible to do with jewelry and um, maybe take one of my books with them. It might change their whole life in a direction that uh, it has been such a, a wonderful life for me and that I would actually like to uh, pass that on to other young people. When I started my mentoring program and taught scores of young people how to do uh, the type of work that they do. When we first, we first met, it was at a Renaissance Fair in Northern California, and I had come for fun, and I was wearing a, a crown that I had made. I had talked to a vendor earlier, and she said to me, you should really go a few steps down. There's a, a master artist there that does this incredible work and I, I know you're looking for an apprenticeship, like definitely go talk with them. Finishing my college degree, I thought I want to find someone who is going to be able to teach me what I want to know. And what was really important about the apprenticeship to me was the first thing that drew me was the power and the archetypes behind it. And when I had been making jewelry before, I hadn't really found where I wanted to go with it. You know, the real work starts like educating people, sharing the story with them. The goddess that they were drawn to is their life story. And they're just so moved instantly there as you can see it happen. And, I mean, making the jewelry in and of itself, I think, is a ceremony. Like you get so involved in the piece. The way that I put my ceremony into them is, is when I'm making them, you know, my emotions that go into them and be in a meditative state, you know, let the jewelry really come from my heart. More doing, I, I've always thought of it as more art than jewelry per se, and I think it definitely is a tradition that needs to be continued. The apprenticeship there was, was what made that happen. Yeah. You know, you know, enough to where when we left, I felt like, that's it, this is what we're going to do. You know? At that point was when we realized that, that we can do this for a living, and we can do what we love to do for a living. But, also being able to do something that is more spiritual, you know, and being able to do that full time. It brings more meaning into everything that we do. So it wasn't just learning the jewelry you're making from me, it was also the whole experience, the yeah. spiritual side of it too. You know, that Definitely. made a huge difference being there to do it. And I think that comes through in the jewelry itself. 20 years later almost, and uh, you know, we do a, a thing with the high school here to where we take on a high school student almost every year. Mm -hmm. And it's great to be able to pass that on and then see somebody taking it and, and doing like we've done. The spirituality of it too. That was what really caught me. And that was that was awesome. Yeah. I think that I would like to see that spread out in the world. I think it could just uh, be one of the things that can help out there. So I think we've uh, our culture's become way too mechanized, and we don't honor the the other powers that we have available to us. We could change the way some people view art, and and more in the old traditional ways that our ancestors did art. Going clear back to the caves of Europe, um, that's the way art was always treated. It was treated as something very sacred, something very connective with the spirit world. And all the, the wonderful major art pieces throughout history, Egypt, Greece, Maya, their art was all connected with spirit. And I think that's, uh, that's something that's missing in our, our culture today. I, to me, that's what I still want to do. I think uh, that ancient way of approaching art is uh, a healing. It's, it's, a, it's a type of food that people don't realize they need, but uh, when they're around it, it's something wakes up, and that's why the archetypal symbols are so um, needed in films or books or stories of any kind. Uh, things that connect with spirit in, in, a, in a really broad, universal way. They're, they're way important for us, and, and, and if, we're, if they're not around us, we, we try to create them somehow in our life.
This land was undeveloped, so at first I lived without electricity, camping out in the gypsy wagon. I had lived off the grid on the Indian Reservation for 14 years, and so living simply was familiar to me. The studio was built using straw bells for their environmentally friendly insulation. Most of the windows are in the south to take advantage of the winter sun heating the building with passive solar energy. When you build your own house, the process continues for many years. The project now is to generate electricity from the sun. I also plan to convert my 38 Jaguar to an electric vehicle for local trips to town on sun-powered batteries.
Well, I think, I think the, uh, the hardest lesson is that literally everything that happens to me is my own creation. And it's hard to follow the track back a lot of times. You say, well, how did this come to me? But if, if you really go back, you can usually find when you thought a certain thought, you desired something, and it's come back to you, but in a way that you don't hardly recognize. So that has taught me to really be careful about what I'm thinking and feeling because it is basically creating what's going to happen to me, what's going to come back to my life. Magic isn't always comfortable. You know, you, you want something and, and your unconscious doesn't always just make it a real easy, beautiful journey. Sometimes you have to get your back broken <laughs> to make it happen. It's, it's the, the unconscious doesn't do things in a logical way or the way that you would choose it to do. And, and really, we have to be very careful what we want. There's all these life passages I've been through, and I look back, and some of them were so meaningful, uh, you know, the, the times. And, and now that I have gone around the sun 69 times, I really feel like my, my, this, my, this, this passage of, of this time in my life is, um, I'm finally settling into being an elder. And it's, it's a wonderful time. It's a wonderful... Uh, there, there's things about it maybe aren't real comfortable, uh, a few aches and pains here and there, but really to be an elder, in the old way, the elders were so respected and they, they, they always were leading ceremonies, they were helping the children, they were being mentors. And as an elder, if you don't reach out to the children, you're hurting someone out there because that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be out there helping the children. And in our culture where we send them off to school or to college, it doesn't feel the void that is left when the elders are separated from the, from the family. In, in my life, you know, it, it's a... Uh, you know, I just became a grandfather yesterday, and that's, that to me was the final nod that, yes, you're an elder now. Well, people, often wonder why I use symbols from all different cultures all over the world. Every culture is part of me. And I, wherever I travel in the world, I'm inspired by the symbols and the, the beautiful archetypes that are there everywhere. When I was in college and studying different art all over the world, I wondered why certain pieces takes your breath away. These pieces are so powerful. I, kn I knew early on that I wanted that type of, of feeling to be in my work. I couldn't find anywhere a teacher or a book that would tell me exactly why that happened. All I know is that in, in, in desiring that in my heart and reaching out to everything I could study about their, these artists' lives, what, what I came to realize is that the artists that had that in their work were the ones that were more like priests or shamans and had that intention of, uh, you know, being connected with the spirit world, being connected with the, uh, the one power that uh, is, is the universe, that is everything, uh, all that is. The same nerve endings that are in our brain are basically through our whole bodies. Our brain is our whole body, it just isn't our head. Our culture has kind of made us into those kind of uh, humans of walking heads. And, and um, through ceremony, through you know, deep meditation, other disciplines, uh, you can access that incredible body wisdom. And that body wisdom is what I try to touch into when I do my art. Because my head takes me in, in kind of interesting places sometimes, but 
maybe sometimes not so interesting and not so helpful to me or the world. This bezel is made out of 24 karat gold, which there again is a very soft metal and easier to push than the sterling. So I'm just going to work that down over the stone. And actually the moonstone has um, some internal light in it. As you look at it from different angles, it'll look like a little crescent moon, that vine in there. I feel like my purpose is to create art. I, I figured that out a long time ago as a young man, that that's why I came here. I'm in this country where all the cultures come to, all the teachers from all different disciplines, and they all are talking about the same thing. And that's the powers of the self, our own body energies are the symbols that are in the archetypal symbols of all religions. And in my art, I want to honor all of my ancestors. I think they all have a gift. You, you go through every one of them and, and you, you say, wow, now that's something I can use in my life. That, that is something that connects me with a power that I want to be connected with. trademark that I put on all my jewelry. Uh, the Hayoka and the Sacred Balance. Symbols from all over the world appear in my work. And I've traveled now in, in mostly all the continents of the world. Any, any shaman, if they're deep enough into their path, they have a knowing that it's all the same religion. There is no difference. There is no uh, uh, good or bad or, or right or wrong. It's, it's, it's humanity, it's us, and, and all the, the different the sacred teachings are talking about us. In my way of seeing life, I think we all choose to come here. We choose a lot of the circumstances that our life is going to be uh, lived in. We can sort of design our life as we come in to a certain extent. And I believe we all come here with a gift. The main challenges of life on earth is to find our gift and then find a way we can give away that back into the circle of life. For me it was art and later on ceremony. I, I think that 
It's a giveaway to all humanity and also to the earth and, and all living, all living beings really. The sun dancing has, uh, with, with all the energy of all the dancers, has become my primary ceremony. Um, I've been doing it for over 30 years now. And it's the time of my life, uh, the, my cycle of my year, that I get closest to spirit. It's a time that I, I don't think about work or art or any problems I have. It's, it's a total immersion into the world of spirit. And it's a time when I'm closest to my helpers, the helpers that help me if I'm doing a healing ceremony or helpers that if I'm doing a ceremony for a teaching of a, a young person or if I'm creating a, a teaching through art. Calling in a, a, a sacred archetype that'll come in and benefit the people. So sun dancing with the muse is, is my time that I'm, I'm closest to that spirit world. And the other time when I'm the closest is when I'm creating art. And it also puts me into that same place where I have that communication and I'm no longer cut off from our heritage because we all come from spirit, we all go back to spirit. But at that time of dancing or setting down and creating some piece of art, that's the time when those two worlds come together for me and they're all one. Oh, oh, oh.